All right. Oh, is this loud enough? I guess. I think so. It's okay. Yeah. All right. Let's go then. Um. Two shift plus. All right. Homework four is up. Due next Wednesday. Uh, you can do it immediately. <laughs> Don't need to wait for us to cover anything. Um, lab five um, is due next Tuesday. Um, lab four, if you haven't already submitted your project, um, make sure you, you um, submit your project file by tonight because it closes tonight. And of course, your score is based on when you demo. Uh, not when you submit your project, um, but you do need to submit the project, the zipped archive. Okay, make sure all your sources are in there. I've encountered several people now who had did not copy their sources into their project directory, and so they zipped their file, project file, but none of their sources came with them. Okay, so you need to make sure your source files actually live in the project directory. Okay, end of speech on that subject. Um, all right, so what's happening in the near future? Um, so Friday, I uh, will go over um, intro to lab six, which will be a two and a half week lab. Um, and then Monday's a holiday. Uh, Tuesday, you have the lab five demo and um, lab six will be available. Um, actually, Lab 6 will be available on Friday if you want to get started. Um, and we have a midterm coming up um, in about a week. Wait, one? Two and a half weeks. Okay, so we're, we're uh, getting far out. Any questions? Yes. All of lab. So, you know, I've had people finish lab six in two or three days because they're really into it. <laughs> they they just want to do it, and and they're I guess they like uh, getting hardware and and seeing things on the screen. So it can be done in just a few days. Generally, the people who wait two or three days before the deadline, <laughs> don't get it done in two or three days, okay? So leave yourself plenty of time. Um, there will be some uh, bonus points available <laughs> to offset any uh, late previous labs. And um, so demoing it early will earn, earn you uh, bonus points, and then there's another milestone that also gets you bonus points. Uh, and and you'll, we'll talk about the details when it's actually posted. Um, and we do this because we, people underestimate how long it will take, how much trouble it'll be to debug. Um, plus, it's very hard for all the tutors and TAs to demo everybody in the last few days. So the more people that can demo early, the, the easier it is. Any other questions? No other questions. Okay. All right. So let's start talking about um, multipliers. We'll go back to third grade. Yes. Um, all right. Okay. So um, way back in third grade, you learned how to multiply two numbers. All right. And. Um, you may not have quite used this terminology, but there was a multiplicand and a multiplier, and of course, it doesn't matter which number is which because you get the same thing. Multiplication is commutative, but we will refer to one of them as the multiplier and one of them as the multiplicand to keep them straight. Okay. Um, you normally did this in uh, base 10 because you probably didn't know that there was any other base but base 10 in second, in third grade. 
Um, and you did this by taking the first digit, of the rightmost digit of the multiplier, and in your head multiplying it by the multiple sign. And that required you to uh, retain the carry in your head. So you did 8 times 3, which is 24. And so you put the 4 down, and you remembered the 2. And then you did 8 times 2, which is 16. Remembering the 2, then that would have been 18. So now you have to remember a 1. So you did 8 times 1, which is 8, plus the 1 you remembered. And that was a 9. Okay, and you did this uh, remembering that carry. I think there's another method that was taught with grids and diagonals. And um, it was much slower to do it that way, but much easier. Okay. Okay, and so you did this for every digit of the multiplier. So you did this for 8, and then you repeated it for the next digit. And if we had a third digit, we'd have a third row, but we only have two digits here, so we only have two partial products. So each one of these uh, rows was is a what we call a partial product. It's the product of one digit with the multiple term. Okay, and then once you've got had your partial products and you added them up, and you got your result. Okay, so this should seem very familiar. Now, if we were doing this in binary, there's some really good news. It is trivial to multiply by zero or one. Yay. That's that's simple. The bad news is there's a lot more digits. Okay, so if we were going to do the same multiplication in binary, um, this is 123, this is 78, and our partial products are either 0 or 123. Shifted, though, because every time we go to the next digit, um, the radix um, increases, right? So here... We bumped it, uh, one, one position was uh, radix 10. Here it's going to be 2. And so you'd add all these partial products, and now we had 8 partial products. Okay. So this is how we're going to do, this is one way of doing multiplication in binary. We can, in fact, generate all of these partial products and then have a large array of full adders to add them together. All right, so um, here uh, B is the multiplier, A is the multiplicand, and um, here's the first partial product. And to get the partial products, all we need to do is and with B. All right, if B is 1, we get the multiplicand. If B is 0, we get all zeros. And we add them together, and notice how they need to shift over. Okay, so a couple things about um, this array. Um, you'll notice that there are some zeros in here, feeding in here. And I just want to talk about this because this is something that Zivato does for you in synthesis. If you plug in a constant value into a, a particular component, Say you have, this is a full adder. This would be your circuit for full adder, right? And if you look at the full adders on the end and in the top, the carry-in is zero. And if it's in the top row, the one of the sum bits that you're trying to add is zero. And so if you follow, if you plug in zero into this circuit, Right, this this zero will go through this XOR gate, and the output will just be X because X XORed with zero is X. Likewise, this zero will go into this AND gate, and the output of the AND gate will be zero, and the output of this AND gate will be zero. If you OR two zeros together, you get zero. So in effect, one of the things that synthesis does for you is it propagates all of those constant values and turns your circuit into a much simpler one by just pushing all those values through. So this 
full adder with the zero plugged in just becomes a wire. Right, whatever value you have on x, that's the, what the sum bit will be. And in fact, the carryout will be also be zero. So it probably took that carryout and pushed it through the next full adder. Right? So let's see what happens if our carry in is zero. If our carry in is zero, right? So we're going to feed a zero here. Well, what will that do? It'll turn it into a half adder because what will happen is this XOR gate will disappear. Whatever, if you XOR with a zero, it doesn't change the other argument. And uh, this AND gate will disappear. So now you're just adding two bits, X and Y. So you still can get a carry out. And of course you want the sum bit, which is the XOR of X and Y. So this is part of what Vivado is doing to you. Um, and um, Neil asked me to do a public service announcement. He would like people to stop putting their entire design in one file because you're not taking advantage of incrementing, incremental compile. When Vivado synthesizes, it checks which files changed and it only recompiles the one that's changed. So it's like compiling your C program, a huge C program. You don't want to do that. You only want to, you want to take advantage of the object files that didn't change and just compile the ones that did change. Okay? So it probably didn't matter for lab one, two, you know, three you were getting there, but now it's going to start to matter. <laughs> it's going to take you a whole lot longer to synthesize when you make a change if you have your entire Verilog code in one file, or even large chunks. Okay, end of public service announcement. Okay, so this is one of the things that it'll do, is it'll propagate those constants to you. And so our array, you know, uh, it gets simplified a little bit. We have half adders on the end here, and that top row would have gotten um, erased. But this is still a large circuit, right? If we have an n by n, we're multiplying two n bit numbers, we're going to have n squared roughly full adders. Um, so this is expensive. There are, there are tricks to, to uh, reduce the expense um, using um, different encodings, using redundant encodings, which allow you to subtract uh, values instead of you, that you shouldn't have added. <laughs> but um, uh, more economical or um, approach is actually to use less uh, hardware, less circuitry uh, by uh, making a sequential circuit. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to build a sequential multiplier, and this is a very basic one. There are, of course, more sophisticated ones um, than this. Um, but let's talk about uh, how this is going to interact with the world first, because um, that's important. So this is going to take a number of clock cycles before it produces the result. The result's not available immediately. It um, takes as input two n-bit numbers, a and b, and then it has to have a signal to start because it's not unlike the, um, this is a combinational circuit, right? You plug in A and B and then you, as long as you wait enough time for it to settle, you have the result. But um, the sequential one's going to take a number of clock cycles, a fixed number of clock cycles. So you don't want to go look at the, you don't want to use the result until in fact you know that it's valid, that it actually corresponds to it. And so this multiplier has an output that indicates when the result is valid. Okay. This output also tells, um, also indicates when the multiplier isn't busy. Because if you try to start the multiplier when it's in the middle of a previous multiplication, it may not be able to respond quickly. Okay. 
So there are different design um, ways to design this, but here's the, here's the protocol that we're going to follow. So um, here's our clock. So the idea is um, if you want to use this multiplier, what you need to do is you need to make a go signal high on the clock edge. So you will assert go on a particular clock edge. Now, um, you, the two arguments, A and B, uh, should both be there on that clock edge. They need, they need to be valid on that same clock edge. Okay, so whatever values are present on the clock edge where you give the go signal, then um, those are the values you're going to multiply. Of course, um, you shouldn't do this unless ready is high. So ready will be high here. And um, all right, so what happens? Well, so you're going to make go high, and, and, and I don't know what happens to it afterwards. Uh, but ready will then um, go low. And um, let's see, sometime later, let's say at this clock edge, uh, uh, ready will go high. And what that means is that on this clock edge, the output P is actually equal to A star B, <laughs> the, the product of AB. Okay. Um, now, there are lots of, of issues here. Do you need to keep A and B steady here? We will assume not. So we will not require A and B to remain here the whole time. Um, Let's see. Um, what happens if you give another go here? So if you if you have another go here, it will be ignored, right? It isn't until you get a ready that you can send another go. And we could actually start another go here if you want. But okay. But es essentially, we will keep the ready high until you get another go. So let's. That would be all right. So we'll make go high, go high again, and so then ready will go low after. And so the product will remain here until you get another go. And now who knows what it is? Okay, any questions on how this is going to work? I mean, how how it's going to interact with the world. So if this is part of your circuit, you are responsible for making sure A and B are valid when you assert go, when go goes high at a clock edge. And then when ready goes high again, on the following, next clock edge where ready is high, P is valid. So you could use the fact that ready is high to uh, clock in this value somewhere else or use this value somewhere else. Okay, if, if go goes high in between, it will be ignored. Okay, all right. Okay, so um, what do we need uh, to build this multiplier? Um, hmm. So we, we need to do uh, basically generate partial products, right? Um, let's see, let's go back here. Right, and this, we need to generate all these partial products and then add them. But when we add the next one, it's going to be shifted over, right? 
Um, so we need some way to generate these partial products. And um, as we get them, we're going to add them together one by one. All right, so um, all we're doing is we're taking each row of the combinational multiplier, each row of flatters, and reusing it. So in instead of feeding the output to the next row, we're going to load the output into flip-flops to register, and then we're going to feed it back in to be reused. So what we have is basically this, this is a row of adders, right? a row of full adders. So this is an adder. So there's our adder. Um, we will use 2n bits for the partial product. And um, we will add the results so far uh, to the next partial product. So this, is this, uh, this type of register is often called an accumulator. Have you heard that term before? No, OK. So way back in the dark ages <laughs> of computers, um, uh, processors just had one register called an accumulator. And if you needed to do an operation, you would just load stuff into the accumulator and add stuff to it or subtract stuff to it. And then you could store it back in the memory or you could pull something from memory and put it into the accumulator. That was your instruction set. That was it. <laughs> and, and, you know, this register is essentially doing that function. It's just accumulating the sum. Okay. So um, we need to be able, you know, these, this is just a, a row of flip-flops, basically, that we can control. So we need to be able to load it with the result of the adder. And uh, it's nice if this starts out as zero because when you start a new multiplication, you want to start your partial products on the zero, right? Okay. All right, so this is one part, right? This is a, the uh, part that's going to add all the partial products. Then we need to generate the partial products. And so what we're going to do is take our multiplicand and shift it to get the next partial product. Okay. Now, a partial product is either, you know, a shifted version of the multiplicand A, or it could be zero. If the, multi if the particular multiplier digit that we're looking at is zero, we don't, we're, we're supposed to add zero. Now, the nice thing about adding zero is like it's like, it is that it's like not adding. So instead of explicitly adding zero, we just won't load the register. Right? No point in generating those zeros and doing the addition. We could just not load the register, and that's like adding zero. Okay, so that, that's what we'll do. Um, the last thing that we need is we need to access each bit of the multiplier one by one, starting with the zeroth bit, B0. And so a convenient way to do that is to load B into a shift register, right? And um, then if we look at the least bits in the shift register, well, the first one will be B0, and then we'll shift. And then it'll be B1, and we'll shift again, and it'll be B2. So by putting in a shift register, we can access, we can just shift each bit into position uh, B0. OK, so the output here is a, a, a n bit vector, but we're really only if interested in the zeroth position. And we're going to shift all the others down into there. Um, one more thing is we need to know when we're done. So we could always run our multiplier, our n cycles. We could do every single digit of the multiplier. However, if there aren't any, if, if this shift register only has zeros, am I ever going to add anything again? No. So as soon as all the bits in here are zero, I'm done. I don't need to keep shifting. I don't need to look at the rest of the bits of the multiplier. In fact, if I try to multiply by zero, I'm done right away. <laughs> okay. Um, 
So, but we need to know that. So um, here we have a uh, NOR gate, which takes all but the least bit as input. And when all of these are zero, we know we're done. So we're going to shift zeros in here. And, and once there's no non-zero multiplier bits, we can stop. OK, so I'm going to now put all of this together. OK. All right, so we've connected it up. Here's the partial products being generated. Um, and uh, here's the uh, part that's adding all of the partial products together. Here's the uh, accumulator that's keeping track of the sum. Well, it looks like my G got bumped down there. OK. <laughs> OK. And whatever's in here at the end, that's the result. That's the product. Right? The sum of the partial product is the result of the multiplication. So when we say we're ready, P is the answer. OK. Um, and here's the shift register for B. OK. So we have the components um, to make things happen. Um, this is often called the data path of a system. And uh, guess what we need? What's the last thing we need to make this happen? What? A ready and go, okay. Yeah, there's no ready and go here. Where, okay. Wh where would go go? <laughs> Good question. Where would you even put them? So we got a bunch of components that can do the right thing. But okay. Right. Right, but it, but if I do if I connect go to load A and B, then if somebody hits go in the middle of the multiplier, it'll just load A and B in the middle, right? Yeah. Oh, I've not thought you'd never say that. <laughs> we need something, somebody in charge, right? So, and um, yeah, so whoever's in charge is going to have to use go. How come I don't have a connection with Go? Okay. I'm missing that. Okay. Okay. So what does my state machine need to know? It needs to know the bit of the multiplier, right? Because that's going to tell it whether to load the current partial product or not, whether we're adding zero <laughs> or the partial or the actual shifted version of A. It's going to know, need to know when to stop. So it's going to need to know if all the remaining bits are zero. Um, it's going to be, it's going to need to know when to go. All right. So it's going to, it's going to receive the go signal. And it's going to have to be, tell the world when it's done. Okay. So this is the control path or of the system. This is the part that makes all the other, makes the rest of the stuff do the right thing at the right time. OK. All right. Um, shall we design this? OK. Um, I'm going to start with a blank paper. Do I have a blank paper? Just do that. All right, so um, what should our controller do to begin with? What should it w do while it's not doing anything? Ready? You want to chill? Yeah, okay. 
or okay so in the chill state we are ready okay so um, so that when you wake up you won't have a result the p will be zero because your, your register will wake up with a zero probably maybe um, and that's okay because presumably uh, no, no one sent any uh, go signal to it so nobody should be checking the result <laughs> Okay. What would what would we initialize it to? Yeah, I mean, you you shouldn't be looking at the output of a multiplier until you've actually fed it arguments <laughs> that you care about, right? Okay. So what should we do now? Yes. Yes, so don't do anything until you get a go signal. So pretty much nothing's going to happen uh, until you get a go signal. And then what should happen if you get a go signal? Yes. What should I load? Okay, so I have two control signals here, right? Um, LA and LB that load these two shift registers. Okay, so I want, I want to assert those. So when we make this state diagram, um, there are a lot of outputs here, right? Six. So I'm just going to indicate the ones that I want to assert. Okay. Anything else I need to do? Yes. Uh, should we also reset the time of the register? That sounds like an excellent idea. I want it to be at zero. I mean, if it's the first time, it probably is at zero, but we could be, this could be the second time or the 90th time we're using the multiplier. Okay, all right. Um, anything else I should do? No, I can't think of anything either. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so here we are. We've loaded A into the shift res uh, into and B into our shift registers, which means we have bit zero coming out. Uh, this is input M to the state machine. Um, and um, we have Z telling us whether there are any non-zero bits after this. Yes. What should we do? Okay, so ready, we're, we're not, we're not going to, okay, ready will not be there. <laughs> so we'll not write ready in that state. Okay, so we have, so we have uh, the first partial product being added to zero, right, because this has a zero. And this has the first partial product here coming out of the adder, sitting here on the D input. Do we want to load it? It kind of depends on M, right? We only want to load it if M is one. Hmm. Well. Well, I can't check M here because the register isn't loaded yet, right? But now, when I'm in this state, now M is valid, okay? So, so while we're sitting here, 
those two registers are not loaded yet. They're only going to be loaded after I make the transition because this indicates that on the clock edge that takes us from chill to whatever we're going to call this state, <laughs> that's when we will assert. And so those shift registers will be loaded on that same clock edge. So when we land here, then A will be valid and M will be valid. Okay. Um, let me ask you this. Are we going to basically shift every clock edge, you think? Well... Well, okay, but, but, you know, this is hardware, so we got to take advantage of concurrency, yeah. Yeah, so these two registers here, they can shift in parallel, and, and we can also load this on the same clock edge as that this is shifting. Yeah, all these components exist. They can operate in parallel. I don't, I don't want to do one thing. I don't want to state for one thing and then have to change state and do the next thing and have to change state and do the next thing because then I'm not taking advantage of the fact that all these things can happen simultaneously. It's like, if, you know, it's like your shift register with nine flip-flops. They can all pass simultaneously to the next one. Right? So I'm going to be adding one partial product every clock cycle. Okay, so that means that I need to load, I need to load the register here if the multiplier is one, and I need to shift both of these constantly. Okay, so while I'm over here, I'm going to shift A and I'm going to shift B. But I don't want to load the register unless what? Well, it depends on Z, right? I'm sorry. So if M is 1, then I want to load the accumulator. Well, so, so the Z and M are not independent, right? So if you look at, if you look at M and Z, if M is 1, well, okay. M is bit zero, and um, Z is the um, NOR of SB N minus one and one. Okay. Um, the question is, it, do I want to stay here or do I want to go back? If Z is if Z is not true, I, if I have not Z and M, I want to stay here. But if I have Z, then I go back. Okay, yeah. Well, okay, so we, we shift the partials, we shift A to get the partial products, right? Yeah. But we're shifting B to get one bit, uh, to look at one bit of the multiplier at a time. Oh, so they're not being shifted in the same direction. A is being shifted left, B is being shifted right. 
Yes. That was, that was unclear. Now that that's clear, I understand what's going on. Shift right. Where'd it go? It shifted A. This one's going to left. Far right three bits. And then adding that is just cumulative. Is what's going on. All right, where where Once you've you've run out of ones in B after repeated inputs and then writing, then you're done. I can I then I'm done. All right. So if z is one, that means I'm done. There or I'm about to be done. There are no, no point in staying here because the remaining bits are going to be zero. But if z is not one, z is zero, then um, I want to stay here. But I only want to load p if m is one. Okay, so I, I'm going to have to have two separate arcs here. So if I have Z and M here, I'm going to load P. But if I have Z and not M, I'm not going to load P. Okay, so whether, whether I load, whether I actually add the partial product depends on M, whether the multiplier bit is 1 or 0. If it's 0, I don't want to load P. And where I go next depends on z, whether there are any more bits to add, it, whether the multiplier has any more non-zero bits. Okay, so this is great. If you're multiplying by zero, you're going to be done in two cycles. You're going to go here. You're going to say, oh, it's zero. Go back. <laughs> Um, okay, any questions on this? Okay. All right, so there's our state machine. Hopefully it looks like a lot like what I just wrote. Does it? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so two states is enough. We can do simultaneously shift these two and load P. Uh, they work all in parallel, <laughs> like gears, if you like, in a clock. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, so let's implement our state machine. Um, I have only two states. So this is pretty simple, right? Um, so if I were to make a transition table, What would it look like? Hmm, let's make a transition table. All right, state transition table for our state machine. Uh, present state. Well, that's easy. We just have two. Chill. And uh, the other one I called shift add. Okay, and now I need inputs. How many input variables do I have for my state machine? Oh, what happened to it? How many inputs? Three. Okay, so how many values can three input variables take on? Eight. Ah! So in... I need eight different columns in here. Well, that's, okay, that's not good. This is too big. Uh, all right, so that's just for the next state. How about the outputs? How many outputs do I have? So, so I need eight columns. How many outputs? Six? Oh, I think you forgot ready. Seven. Seven. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not ready for this. Oh. All right, so seven. Now, do they depend possibly on the inputs? 
Is it mealy? Oh, so potentially I have eight outputs and each one, sorry, seven outputs and each one, 56 columns. Okay, so what time do you need to leave me? <laughs> I am, yes, there's a different way, there's a different format in these systems. Okay, so in the state transition tables that we've done before, we've had um, a row for each state and then a column for each input value. And fortunately, we haven't had very many inputs. The maximum was two, right, in the message checker. And that quickly is not going to become a reasonable way for us to make transition tables. So instead of making a one row for an, uh, a state, we're going to make a row for each transition in the um, state diagram. Okay, so what is this going to look like? Well, all right. Okay, so what, so what we want to do is we'll have our states again. But instead of making eight values, we're going to make a column for each input. So we have a go input, we have M and Z, right? And then we're going to indicate what's the next state. So for chill, potentially I could have eight different rows if there were eight different transitions. But there are only two transitions out of state go, right? And they depend on whether you're ready. All right, there are only two transitions out of chill and they depend on go. So the only thing I care about in state chill is whether go is zero or one. It doesn't really matter what M and Z are. Okay. So this is not a don't care. This is basically saying either one. So in fact, when we write something like this, when, when you see zero dash dash, what this means is that this covers zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, and zero, one, one. This represents these four values in a much more compact form. Okay, so we are, in this case, our next state is chill. And in this state, our next state is just add. Right? Okay, what about the outputs? Okay, so now we're going to make a column for each output. So we have ready, uh, LA, LB, shift A, shift B. Um, I think we have reset P and uh, load P. Yeah, that's seven. Okay. And now we, we can indicate the values. Okay. So this is a format um, where each transition, right? Um, and for shift add, we're going to have several different cases to consider. Um, perhaps it's time to just... Look at the table. Okay, so this is what the table looks like now. Um, so we already started it. I started it over there. And um, looks like I have Z and M in the opposite order. <laughs> um, so as, as we noted, uh, if you're in chill, you only care about what go is. In shift add, the next state depends on only on Z. However, you also need to know what M is in order to know whether to load P or not. So we actually had to break this up into four different cases. Okay. What do you argue LB stands for again? So, um, go back. They control this register here where you load the partial product or, or you reset the product to zero. Okay, so we, 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 can, we need to be able to load both registers, shift both registers, and we need to be able to reset this one and also load it. Okay, 
Um, now it turns out that there, you know, we indicated on the state diagram where we wanted these things to be one. So for example, we know that if when we're going from chill to shift add, when we get a go signal, we absolutely need to reset uh, P. We need uh, to load A and load B. Yes. On lab, yeah, you can use this format. Yes, because <laughs> it's much more compact, isn't it? Okay. Um, the important thing here is also to put zeros where they are needed, right? We know we need to load A and load B here, and we didn't say anywhere else we needed to load them. The question is. Do we, are there places where we could also load them and it wouldn't hurt? And the answer is, yeah. We can be loading them and shifting them while we are in state chill awaiting the next go signal. There's no reason we, wouldn't, we couldn't do that. And so that's why these are question, question marks here. Okay, because we really don't care what value is. On the other hand, once we start the multiplication, we do really care <laughs> that they not get loaded again until we're done. And so most of these have to be zero. We could actually have them be question marks here. Uh, because here we're going back to chill. So I could put question marks here. Okay, so you have some freedom here. We know when you want to do things, and you need to figure out when you don't want to do things, and then the rest is up for grabs. And, and how is that important? Well, so one of the things you can do is reduce the number of outputs once you have this table, because you can look here. Um, shift A and Shift B, do they look very similar? Yes. So you don't need two separate shift outputs. They're both the same. So, okay, we lost one output. How about load A and load B? Yes. Okay, um, all right, what about anything else you can combine? So we, we we're down to five now, right? Because we got rid of one load and we got rid of one shift. What about RP and LP? Can I combine them with something else? Probably not. So if you look at LP, it disagrees with uh, everything else at some point. Like. Here it disagrees with shift A and shift B, and then here it disagrees with the load. So RP is going to have to be its own out. Yes? Should this be a don't care? Is that what you're asking? Can I make that a don't care? Yeah, I could set them to zero, yes. Then I could make them the same as RP, yes. So RP could be combined with uh, LA and LB. Um, or I could combine ready with LA and LB. Right, that's a choice. Ready can also be combined with LA and LB, but I can't combine all four, <laughs> so that won't work. It's very important that RP and LP be zero because remember this multiplier is holding the result in the P register. You don't want to change that <laughs> until you get the next go signal, right? Because you don't know when, it, when that P register will be used. You're, t you're telling the world it's ready, so you better keep it ready. Yeah.
So ready could be a not shift A and not shift B. That would work too. RP with, that would work too, yeah. Okay, so there are lots, there's lots of interesting work here in what, what this is called output packing and combining these um, different um, signals, trying to make as few as possible because each one, of course, requires logic. You don't want to duplicate logic. Um, do these remind you of instructions? How many of you have had 120? Opcode. Opcode, exactly. So in a processor, you would have something like this. You'd have a data pack, and um, your instructions might have multiple states, and then you have the output corresponding to each state. All right, so this is, an end, this is much simpler <laughs> because we're only making a multiplier, so we're only shifting and loading the accumulator. <coughs> okay, but you could imagine that this might be a multiply instruction inside your processor. Okay. Yes. 